The rocks of the Bjolt Inlier are middle to late Ordovician in age, around 465 to 455 million years old. At this time, Wales was part of the microcontinent Avalonia, which lay in the southern subtropics, with the Iapetus Ocean separating it from North America. The Bjolt Inlier preserves a complete history of a volcanic island complex, from its emergence to its erosion and disappearance. The whole process took around 10 million years and covers an area of around 50 square kilometres. The setting envisaged is that of a single caldera complex on the scale of Santorini. Some of the sedimentary sequences indicate a large, quiet water lagoon in the centre of the inlier. The story begins on an extensive mid to outer shelf region in the Didymograptus artis biosome in the Middle Ordovician. This thick sequence of siltstones and shales gets gradually coarser upwards and is interrupted near the top of the biosome by volcanic activity in the eastern part of the area. It is followed by a return to quiet water silt deposition. However, the quiescence didn't last long. Several episodes of volcanic tuff deposits are interspersed with argillaceous deposits. The water depth is very difficult to work out, but seems to have reached a maximum of 200 metres. Surrounding the inlier are much later rocks from the latter Late Ordovician and, more extensively, the Silurian. The Silurian deposits mostly represent quiet, offshore shelf conditions with laminated grey siltstones full of graptolites. You think it's Hornfell stuff? Hmm? Well, I wonder if it could be a Hornfell stuff. <laughs> <laughs> for, that, we'd need a tough for that we would need an intrusion, of course. Um, and mm. there isn't one, no. is the problem. Because yeah. um, if it were, if there was, it would be obvious here. Yeah. As the, the dolerite always forms the high ground. Yeah. And just, yeah. it, the way it happens <laughs> is quite distinctive. Yeah. So, um, so if it's not Hornfell, it's good. Well, it's not baked. Yeah. Let's have a look, oh, quick look at the lens. <coughs> and I can certainly see, oh, there's flakes of quartz in there. Angular bits. Yeah, yeah, little bits of feldspar crystals. It's tough. That is quite, quite definitively a bit of volcanic ash. Forget that, forget it, forget it. The trouble is, it, you take a picture, it just, uh, it doesn't do it justice. No, 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 I'm doing a plant, sorry. Uh, oh, it's good. Uh, it's good. Uh, it's good. Uh, Books can't be related. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Loads of foxgloves yeah. fox yeah. around here. So, <clears throat> we are currently in the built in layer. And you can recognise it because it's got Ordovician rocks, which kind of be, tend to be hard and lumpy, and it's got intrusions, and there's nothing consistent about it. I mean, you're fully used to places where a formation might be a few hundred metres thick, and you can follow it for miles, yeah. hundreds of miles sometimes. It doesn't work like that around here. Quite often a formation is restricted to half a mile, and then it reaches out from 100 metres to nothing, and something else replaces it. That's just a thing with volcanic islands. So, um, we're looking at an area where the landscape is affected dramatically by the rocks underneath. So if you look in the far distance over there, you've got this big rounded massif. That's the Ratna Forest. 
it is at the highest point in the air, it's over 2,000 feet, and um, it's basically late Silurian, mid to late Silurian landscapes. Pretty much what it is. It's just sort of a, a massive array of thick layers of this sort of siltstone, mudstone, mainly siltstone, bits of limestone in it. Uh, not much vaulting, not much tectonics, and so you end up with this sort of huge, great rounded lumps. Go to the right, and you suddenly get this incredibly crenulated outline with a pointed heel with rocks on top of it. That's that Nebby Rocks. Exceptional fossils is you see the bright pink farmhouse to the right. Just up uh, above left of that, you've got the bracken covered slope. At the top of that, there's a scree slope, which is where the uh, yeah. that's where all the exceptional stuff is. And it's a long walk in from the road. <laughs> right, um, bright pink farmhouse with buildings around it. Um, I'd say it's white. Just down from the first sort of rugged summit, yes, yes. there's a big scree slope about two thirds of the way up. Oh, that's scree, is it, rather than bracken or whatever? It's, well, there is bracken there as well, but there's a big scree slope up there as well. Okay, yeah. um, but that's the Hanneke Rock site. Okay, okay. So that whole complex there is a series of volcanic layers with mudstone and ashes between them, um, but really thick, tough deposits forming the high ground. So you can see the edge of the inlayer where you go from those rounded Silurian hills to Andegli Rocks. And the edge of the inline is basically around there. But of course, between here and there, we've got soft, rounded, gentle sort of terrain, because that's all Silurian too. If you remember the shape of the inlier, if I do it reverse, it's sort of that shape. So Andegli is sticking up at one end, and we're part of the bit that's sticking up at the west end, and it is an embayment which follows the boundary between the nice green fields and then the rugged highlands. So that's the edge of the inlay, which you can see going all the way around here. And once you sort of pick it out, you can see it when you're driving around here. It's just a different sort of rock. So, um, so yeah, so down there is all Siberia. There are great big fault plains running along the edge of the inlay, which have moved a kilometre or so. So there's actually a little bit of a that. And there's something like a kilometre of early Silurian. There's probably about the same of late Ordovician. So it probably moved at least two kilometres along the plain between here and here. Vertically. So it, it's a lot of movement. But, uh, but the high ground is, just as an aside, is where you find loads of standing stones, little hut circles, quarries, and so on. And in fact, we actually think that the. Um, oh, Raven, I think.
as the whole thing was trying to um, be sort of compressed. So you get a big picture around the edges of it and the whole thing together. Basically, the inlier has come up relative to all of the surrounding rocks. Is there a probe in gravity? Yeah, gravimetric surveys. It, it was already um, hypothesised from the spar waters because one of them was lithium. Um, oh, then wow. We also have radon problems in the yeah. cellars around here. So is that from granite? That, that's from granite. Yeah. yeah. Lithium and radon, you basically. Uh, they're very incompatible elements, so they basically go into the later stages of crystal formation within igneous rocks. So normally you get this in Cornwall, um, where you have these huge granite mountains and the pegmatites concentrate inside it. So the last stages of crystallization. And, uh, and so yes, just in the well, uh, in the, in the, uh, all the lithium and so on in these wells, it was pretty clear there must be granite there somewhere. But then there was gravity survey going in 2002, billion dollars I think. Anyway, um, who found that there was this mass of lighter than Yeah, I hope it's good. Yeah, I hope it's good. Yeah. How, how long would the molten process probably take? Because it'd be very vulnerable. Everyone just finding stuff before it might take a minute. Right. <laughs> Attention, please. So, this is the upper quarry, which is um, less famous than the other ones, but really shouldn't be. In fact, in paleontological circles, this quarry is now the one that people think about since about 2011 when we finally published it. So those um, hydroids, uh, which, by which we actually mean predatory sponges, are from here. Um, there are soft-bodied uh, worms and bits of arthropod and so on um, in this rock. And it's been overlooked for 50 or 60 years because it's so hard to spot the pyrotized stuff. But the basic arrangement is dolerite at the end. That end wall you can see is clearly sort of igneous. And that's what's been quarried out. The underlying part of it is um, basically it's a tilted sill. So it's a, a sort of sheet of dolerite going that way. Mm -hmm. Underneath it is the mudstone, the upper layers of which have been hardened, they're baked. So you can see these hard layers at the top, which have been sort of sliding down just here. That's all baked stuff and is really good for grap flights, but not a lot else. So do you mean it's metamorphic or going that way? Um, it's contact metamorphism. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but underneath it you have this really soft black shale, about two meters of it, which is extraordinarily rich in fossils if you get it unweathered. But normally of course it's weathered. And because it's triple SI one needs quite a sort of serious permission to be able to attack the outcrop for very good reason. But there's normally loose blocks lying around which we can find some fossils in of the, the soft bodied fauna. So this is the Conservat Lagerstatt. I mean, it's listed in, in list of Ordovician and exceptional faunas around the world. Um, it's normally on a sort of, if someone's publishing a summary of them, there'll be maybe 10 faunas in the Ordovician, and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very, very special place. 
um, but it's also full of really spectacularly beautiful graptolites, which Lucy probably wants to say something about. I, I think we can just let people explore them. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are lots of sponges as well. You may get the odd bit of trilobite here, but it's a slightly different bed. This is slightly, we think, below the level that we're looking at in the other quarry, and slightly above the level in the main quarry. But it's sort of interval of um, slumps of black mudstone that just covered things, um, uh, probably alive in many cases, and you can get layers that are packed full of sponges. So you can see a sort of rusty weathering coming mm -hmm. out from one level of over there. Mm -hmm. That's a layer of sponges. The, all the rust is the pyrite from the sponges that's oxidising and trickling yeah. down the surface of the, the cliff. Yeah. It's just completely covered in thousands of those sciatophytes. Yes. Have a look around, and this is where you really get to test out your graptolite identification skills, because there's a lot more diversity here than there was in the other quarry. Yes, and um, yeah, you'll find lots of graptolites. It is possible to narrow down the age using the really obvious ones, but you're going to have to look for the more subtle ones if you want to get the age exactly. Yeah, yeah there's one in particular which is a beautiful thing, and if you find that, you'll know it. Yes. So, so off we go. go. <laughs>so we're at the end of the quarry and we can see this huge uh, blocky dolerite cell clambering up there do some alteration on the surface of it and then what appears to be underlying it and dipping to us is this black mudstone which has been it's very uh, thinly bedded, just like slate really, but it's full of uh, full of fossils, um, probably contact metamorphism. So I think this could be the underlying bed. If the uh, we if we look down the quarry face, I guess the dolerite has been removed. And that's a group. Checking out the, the remnants of the uh, quarry for fossils. So what is noticeable in the scree here, we can see bits of rock with white surfaces. I'm going to focus in on this one here. And these are thin veins of calcite. You can see that one there. And there's another one there. And here you can see a thick vein of calcite in this rock here, which when broken up is seen there. 